session is called Old Media and New Media. Uh, I'm the old guy. Yeah, John is the old guy. I'll, I'll, he's the far more the important person than uh, that I am. So uh, I'll introduce myself and then I'll introduce uh, our enemy guest. Um, I'm David D'Angelo. I blog at the blog Two Political Junkies. Uh, it's a local uh, left-leaning blog in here in Pittsburgh, and we've been blogging about uh, eight years or so. We started in September of uh, 04 and um, had a smattering of traffic, and I think recently we just hit two million hits, uh, which is really a, it's a nice round number uh, and stuff. What I tend to do is different from what, obviously, what John tends to do. Uh, he gets paid for what he does. Uh, I don't get paid. Uh, and I tend to comment on news and comment on comment, uh, other commentary uh, in a way that, that I think it allows me a little more freedom to say stuff than what you have to say. Uh, but wow, there's more people coming in. Come on in, there's plenty of seats over here. They heard you were leaving this, David. <laughs> Uh, don't do that. <laughs> so come on in, have a seat. There's a couple seats over here. There's a chair here. And there's a chair here. Does anyone need another chair? Have a chair. Okay, I'll start again. Uh, shorthand, David D'Angelo, Two Political Junkies, local left-leaning blog. We just hit two million hits. This is John Delano, KDKA, and Pittsburgh Business Times? Pittsburgh Business Times. Coincidentally, we were actually born in the same hospital, um, Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven. But he was born just a few months before me. <laughs> a number of months I, before I. A number of months. A yes. number. We don't go into the number, but it's certainly a number. So, John, why don't you uh, take the floor and uh, chat about what you do a little, and then if you have any questions about what I do, and then I'll pepper you with questions, and then we'll take questions from the, uh, the hall. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Come on, this is interactive. This is interactive. It's all being broadcast. I, Hi, Mom. I've never done that in all my years on television. Hi, Mom. My mother is not watching. I guarantee you she's not watching. I'm the uh, Money and Politics Editor for the CBS-owned station, KDK Television, here in Pittsburgh. I have been with KDK since the fall of 94, when I was hired as a political analyst. Uh, that was a part-time position. I would come in and I would really comment about political polls and about campaigns and elections and things like that. A little over a decade ago, KDK asked me if I would come on full-time to report both business stories, money stories, and political stories, so I've, hence the money and politics editor. Um, it's been, for me, a, a wonderful experience because I had the opportunity, obviously, in my job to meet all the candidates running for public office, whether it's Barack Obama or Mitt Romney or Paul Ryan or, or Joe Biden. Uh, I get a chance to interview all these people in one-on-one -on -one interviews and to try to help the folks here in western Pennsylvania understand who these people are in what I hope is a truly fair and balanced way. Um, I know those words get appropriated <laughs> by others. My job is not at all like David's. David is, and he, uh, he understates his role in the community because Two Political Junkies has become one of the best left, certainly left of center. Yes, um, certainly blogs. left of center. I'll give you that. You would claim I'll that. give you that, John. That. Left of center. Le left of center blogs in this area. and. Uh, and I remember years ago, well, I want to start off with a couple thoughts. And now what we're going to do, we will ask each other some questions, and then we're going to throw this open, because I think it's much more interesting to hear what you have to say and to respond to any questions that you have. Um, I remember a number of years ago, maybe it was right off when you started, David made the mistake of inviting me to breakfast to interview me. Yes. Do you remember this? Yeah, uh, 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 the the. the whole uh, it's now the, uh, the window. The window. The window. I had a bagel. No, I had an English one. I paid. <laughs> yes, you paid. I paid. All oh, that's what I remember. Is I paid. <laughs> and, and David was essentially probing whether or not mainstream media, new media, gave a damn 
about the work he was doing, the blogosphere? Did it have much relevance in the political world in the early 2000s? And if I recall correctly, I was completely wrong, as it ultimately turned out, but I think I made the point back then at least, that we really didn't pay much attention to you guys, that we didn't care too much about the blogosphere. There was a separation between old media, mainstream media, and new media. And it was really distinct a decade ago. We didn't trust what the blogosphere had. We thought most of it was just, just uh, you know, can't be opinions of people who are posting their own stuff, and that it really had no relationship to journalism. And I, I was happy to get the English one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fast forward 10 years, and we are all now part of the new media. Interestingly enough, yesterday I got an email, all of our newscasters, all of the reporters at KDK got an email from our news director reminding us once again that we were not allowed to go home until we had taken our television reports and rendered them in to webcast version. Why? Because KDKA.com is always on. That's the little you know, the, the promo that you'll hear. KDKA.com is where so many people now get their news, as opposed to watching the actual television shows. So before I can go home every night, I have to take my stories, and I put them in the print version, and then our, we've got a team of web folks who then rent, who, who attach video to it, um, the story that aired, and maybe I, if I have some other video that I can get up as well, you know, an extended, for example, when I sat down with Paul Ryan and, and went after him a bit on the abortion, you know, and, and uh, um, forcible rape, you know, whatever that is, uh, question, we put that whole thing up on kdk.com. So we have really become part of new media. Maybe not in quite the way that you would yeah. define it, but we are certainly doing now more than we ever did a decade ago when I bought him his English muffin. And there is, there is a follow-up to that, uh, and we stand up. Yeah. We did uh, have a chat uh, later on, uh, this, uh, a couple of years later, and you, I think, uh, walked back your, your initial impression, and you said that, that at that point it was, if there was some buzz out on the, the, the internet, on the blogosphere, then you could go to your editors or your producers and say, hey, look, I can talk about this because this is what they are discussing uh, online. This is what the... the, the and, uh, and absolutely. And let me give you the, the example. You all know who Luke Ravenstahl is? Yeah. <laughs> Mayor of the city of Pittsburgh, right? Well, we all knew for months and months and months that Luke Ravenstahl had been arrested while he was a city council member at, at uh, um, Heinz Field. I think we all knew that. You know the story we're talking, I'm talking about? Because what ultimately happened was that we all knew about it, but we couldn't, mainstream journalism, we, we couldn't get anyone to talk about it on camera or on the record. And so there was no ability for us to report that story. Because one thing that may separate, still separates all the, uh, the traditional mainstream media, and that's what I would say the local media in particular, from, from the blogosphere and from the new media, is that we need to source stuff. We really have to be careful about what we put on. Because it's not my opinion, unlike what David can do on his blog. It's not my opinion. So we need to source it. Well, what happened was that story about Mayor Luke being arrested at Heinz Field at a football game, or just before a football game, was broken by a blogger. Yeah, uh, John McIntyre. John McIntyre. Um, Mac Yacker? I'm not sure. I think at that point he's he's gone through a couple of different uh, incarnations. At that point, I think it was Mac Yapper. Mac Yapper. Mac Yapper .com. <laughs> He broke the story, and all of a sudden, I could go and I did go to my news director at the time and said, "Hey, this is <coughs> out there." What do you think about us reporting this? Well, we were in the throes of debating whether or not that gave us sufficient ability to report this story when, much to my surprise, Mayor Luke decided to call a press conference to rebut the blog. 
Now, at that point, I got a new story. Because obviously, if the mayor is standing in front of a camera saying, I was never arrested, it only looked like I was arrested. They, you know, they never put my hands in cuffs. They only took me away. And I mean, this, you got into a big definition thing of what is arrest and what isn't arrest. But the bottom line is you had the mayor of Pittsburgh talking about this in reaction to a blog which allowed us to report it. Um, that was back then. Now the question today is if somebody reports something on a blog, we may not wait for that press conference <coughs> to go ahead and put something out there. And so that relationship is, it has changed. And oddly enough, when, when John went with the story, uh, it was basically what you said. Everyone knows about it. No one's talking about it. And I read it. And when I read it, I just kind of went like this because if I was in his position, I wouldn't have gone with the story because, like you, I like to source stuff. Because I can sit on, on my kitchen table, uh, a cup of coffee, I've got a Keurig machine, works really well, uh, and just say basically anything. But if two weeks down the line it ends up not being sourceable, then I end up looking like uh, a jerk. Turns out John was right. Uh, uh, they had taken him away, and it was the definition of is, is, or what the definition of arrest is. Um, but I probably, in his situation, wouldn't have gone with the story, because I would need something to link to, uh, and which points out my relationship with what you guys do, because I have to, the way I see it, at least my own little corner of things, I have to source stuff. I have to find the report that says 2% up, 2% down, or whatever it is, I can't go with, well, this guy emailed me and said uh, X, Y, Z. I, I just can't go with it because how do you prove that? How, if someone were to follow up, I can't go, well, someone told me. If someone told me, well, what does that mean? They could be, they could be dropping acid at that point. They could be uh, just lying to me to try to get me to say something. Um, for instance, there was a, uh, someone emailed me with a story that I didn't go with. It was about, see, I don't know how I can... But I didn't go with the story because I couldn't source it. And I couldn't source it because um, I couldn't find anything online about it. And what it looked like when I looked at the person who was feeding me the story and where the person worked, that if the story went out, it would have made things easier for his boss to do what his boss wanted to do. I'm trying to be very vague. Yes, you are being vague. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> well, it was, it was, it was, it was. But the bottom line is, you uh, you decided not to go forward. With it. Not to go forward because any you know anyone in here who is a blogger, who is a political blogger attached to news. I mean, I get maybe one or two emails a week of why aren't you looking at this? Why aren't you looking at that? You always have to have an ear towards. Well, am I being played? You know, am I being used to get a story out so that the mainstream media can go, oh wait, look, it, it's showing up on the blog that Luke Ravenstahl has um, he dyed his hair red and now he's following the band Fish around, you know, which isn't true, I'll just say it because we're online now. Uh, <laughs> none of that is true, but if it shows up on a blog, someone can say, oh wait, it, on this blog it says blah, blah, blah. So my responsibility, I think gets a little closer to, to journalism, go, well, what is someone going to use this for? And am I going to, am I being played? So even though John was right, I wouldn't have touched that. <clears throat> well, we only did, we were able to go forward with that story back then because the mayor responded to it. Yeah, and, and the mayor made it, it. The mayor made it a story. Had I been advising the mayor, remember he was brand new mayor, um, but had I been advising him, I might have told him to, to shut up. That's usually good advice <laughs> for politicians not in a situation like that. Um, but back then, uh, I know another one of my stories that, that I did source and that I did report, and I took tremendous heat from Mayor Luke over, was my report that he had crashed Oakmont Country Club. Any of you remember this story? Yeah. Tiger Woods was out playing golf, and Mayor Luke wanted to meet Tiger Woods, and he crashed an event to which he was not invited. <laughs> and I reported that on like TV, Luke. and I got huge flack from the mayor. And the mayor went public. He went on he went on a local radio station with the Jimmy Pratt. Uh, what was that, DVE? I think the yeah. other time. Um, and he went on with Jimmy, and he basically said that my story was not true. Well, Jimmy, being a friend of mine, called me up. And of course, knowing 
way this works in this business. They do, you know, anyone in media wants to keep this story going, right? Because it's kind of a cool story. <laughs> they are crashing Oakmont to, you know, to get an autograph from Lou. And uh, um, so Jimmy calls me, and I agree to come on the next day to give my side of the story. But I have to be super careful because I'm not, it's not up to me to refute the mayor one way or the other again because I'm not a blogger. My job as a reporter, I just stated that we at KDK stood behind our story. Why? Because I had sourced it with people who were members of the Oakmont Country Club. I knew exactly what had happened out there when the mayor went out there. He didn't like the story, but it was a true and accurate story. And we went forward with it. I want to say one other thing, and then we really should open this up. Um, I now use social media, and particularly Twitter, at J-O-N-D-E-L-A-N-O, John Delano, at J-O-N, no, it's, guys, join in with me. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, I tweet a lot. Half of my tweets are politics and business. The other half run the entire gamut of the world, depending on what my tweets, you know, followers, uh, those who uh, tweet with me, engage in, because I'll just comment back and forth. So how do I use Twitter? Well, a couple, two, two little, one dirty little secret. Most of our producers now have their own Twitter accounts, and they're following all kinds of people. And if you go to their desks, and they've got multiple screens, um, so you go to their desk, and you'll see that somewhere on one of their screens, they'll have Twitter posted nonstop, 24-7, while they're working, because they're getting continuous feed of news. Old media is using new media to stay very current. For me, as just an individual reporter who likes to tweet, I've used Twitter to find stories. And I'll give you one example of a story where I actually got an award for, um, which was somewhat bizarre because I'm not, I don't think of myself as all hard, as really a hard news reporter, although I, I guess I am doing hard news, but it's not the investigative kind of stuff that the Marty Griffins and Andy Sheehan's and others do. Um, but this was a story that came to me through Twitter and that through DMing on Twitter, you know, the, the, the personal private communications, uh, had to do with the TSA. If you'll remember, the TSA uh, implemented a, a policy, it was a couple, maybe a couple years ago, where they were really going to do body searches. I mean, real body searches. And there were lots of questions as to whether this was constitutional, was this an infringement? I mean, how do you feel about this? Well, we had a lot to talk about it, but what we no one ever got anywhere was a TSA agent who was actually doing body searches. And through Twitter, I found a TSA agent who was willing, as long as I put he or she, I don't, I'm not disclosing gender, in the shadows, which means we had this person talking to us, we disguised his or her voice, and there was no imaging. You couldn't see very well who this person was. But I had that person talk about what it was like to frisk Granny. <laughs> and and uh, it, it turned out to be a great two-part series, and it would have won a, a national, you know, Edward R. Morrow Award for being a hard news story that nobody else in the country had done. I could not have done that story had it not been for new media. That's, I mean, to me, it's the clearest example of what has happened, which is this total nexus between old and new. A decade from now, we're not going to talk about old and new media because we're going to be one and the same. <laughs> so, oddly enough, I don't have a Twitter account. Um, I had one for a while. I re rarely used it, and then it got hacked. Oh, and I mean, I've had that happen. Yeah, and I was I was on vacation, uh, and I got a I got an email. No, I got a phone call from Maria, who's the other political junkie, saying, "Oh, that that um, that website you sent me to doesn't go anywhere." And I said, "Well, what website I sent you to?" And then it was it turned out that someone had hacked into my Twitter account and was sending advertisements. I think you even got. Them. I, I um, and so I just pulled the plug on the whole thing. I I follow Twitter on important stories because it's it's interesting to see something. Uh, happening, being commented on live. But as far as my own Twitter stuff, I, I don't, I don't go because I just don't see that the, the, the minutia of my existence is interesting to anyone other than me. You know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm having coffee. Okay, well, what difference does that make? But I do also have a loose story, 
I don't want to uh, pounce on, on the mayor, but it was one of those things where I was able to write on something that I wasn't sourcing because I had actually seen it. I was, I was a part of the story. It was, there was a uh, debate between uh, uh, Mark DeSantis and Luke Regenstahl at uh, the TAE studios. Um, so yeah, the Channel 4. Yes. And, uh, one of the other. So. Yeah, one of the other. The, <laughs> the, the lesser television station. <laughs> where they don't have a money and politics editor. So I was invited by the, I guess, the DeSantis folks to watch. And I wasn't part of the broadcast. So we were in a room behind a big door and watching basically a television, which is what I could have done at home. Uh, but I was sitting at a table scrib scribbling on notes. And I realized I'm sitting next to um, Rich Lord of the Post-Gazette and I think Brown of the trip. I forget his first name. David Brown. David Brown. And I'm going, okay, he's not one Okay. These guys are professionals. These guys have resources. Uh, they know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're good writers and stuff. What am I going to do that is that can stand as different from the two actual journalists in the room who are taking notes and scribbling frantically as I am? Uh, I'm trying to figure out what the heck to do. And I've realized the only thing that I have as an advantage is I can get something online faster. I can get home if I can write it up and it's interesting. It can be on online at 11. Those guys, whenever the, the Post Gazette updates, which might be midnight or 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever it is. So mine would be the first word of what happens. As it turns out, uh, I didn't have to do that because afterwards we were invited into the studio to do a follow up. I, I'm going to borrow you for a second. And so, okay, I, I walk up to DeSantis, and from my musicology um, past, uh, when you're interviewing someone, uh, the last question they say is a good idea to say, well, is there anything that I forgot? Is there anything that you wanted to add to the debate? So I asked DeSantis that. He kind of gave me a softball uh, question, which I figured was okay. So I walk up to the mayor. The mayor is being interviewed by David Highfield at that point. So he's finished, and I'm shaking the mayor's hand. And I'm going, hi, David D'Angelo, two political junkies. And he does this. Not interesting. And he walks <laughs> out the door. <laughs> Not to be seen at all for the rest. And I'm going, it's like manna from heaven. This is what I write about. And so about an hour later, I maybe an hour and a half, the headline on the blog was, I just got dissed by Pittsburgh Mayor Luke Ravenstall. And that was my story. And I could write about that, even though it wasn't sourced, because I actually saw it. Yeah. Did you ever hear back from them? They no, no, I'm persona non grata. No, they're not interested. Yeah, they're not interested. <laughs> it was very interesting. I was in the middle of the sentence, and the hand just like made its way out of my hand. He was out the door um, into his SUV with the barbecue sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open this up. Yes, sir. Um, I'm one of those rare birds who really likes facts connected to my news. So I've been very much despairing the. Uh, how it, it, news has become entertainment, and yes. now mostly news is opinion. So you've talked about how Twitter has helped you be a better reporter, but I'm also you know, watching the evening news and hearing what Miley Cyrus tweeted today, yeah. as if it was news. Do you yeah. see any real movement back towards, I mean, with all these alleged new reporters out there on the streets with the blogs and everything, do you see anything that approaches where we might get real news again from real people, or is it just going to be more entertainment, more gossip, more discussion. What's yeah, it's, a great, it's a great question. And let me just say that I think you have to differentiate types of news media right. because there is a huge difference. <coughs> cable news is not cable news. It is cable entertainment. It's talking heads. It's uh, the Bill O'Reilly's and the Rachel Maddow shouting at each other. And, and coming, it's like, it's really blog, it's, it's blogging on television. That's really what it is. And so you have very <coughs> strong opinions from very strong personalities who are highly entertaining and who get, you know, they get decent audiences on a, on a given night. Um, that is different from network news. By the way, I will also say that, that Fox, MSNBC, and CNN, obviously there's clear differences politically. Um, CNN is still capable of covering hard news when it breaks. They do a good job of that, I think, of being right there on the spot covering breaking news. But for the most part, CNN, which is getting squeezed between the left and the right, is also moving into this, this uh, talking head kind of stuff. <coughs> Distinct from that, 
We have ABC, CBS, and NBC, and also to some extent PBS, but nobody watches PBS. So ABC, CBS, and NBC, which are the way to reach people. And the truth is that actually more people get their news not on the national newscast, the 30 minutes, but they're getting it on their local newscast. More people watch KDKA, WTAE, and WPXI than Fox, CNN, MSNBC combined. You know, well, I should for the market. For the market, people forget this. Politicians know this, but because that's where they put their advertising. But most most folks out there are not watching these cable entertainment stations. We junkies watch, but most people don't watch it. They're watching local news. So that back to the question of have we in local news become more of an entertaining uh, form of broadcast like the cable folks? The answer is not yet, but clearly there is more entertainment type news. Part of the issue, and I, you know, I, I teach at one of my other hats is I teach public policy at Carnegie Mellon University at the Heinz College. I teach uh, graduate students who are working on their master's degree. And one of the courses I teach is media and public policy. And so I have some familiarity and a lot of interest in this subject. Um, because what's happening to local media is, is naturally a function of the fact that people are not watching TV for news as much as they used to. Right? I mean, back in the old days of your grandparents, people only had three choices. Maybe four if they tuned into QED but basically three choices. Now they have a gazillion choices, <laughs> a gazillion. And trying to get eyeballs to tune into KDKA when people can choose any station, any other format they want to get news is really challenging. It's also challenging on my app because most of my 25 year old students are not watching news on television. They're opening up their laptops and they're picking and choosing what to watch. One thing I so wanted to say is it's a, it's a major problem, and, I, and I'll, I'll just wrap on that real quick just to say that I think that there's a consciousness in local newsrooms that we have to produce and want to produce local content of stories around us, what's happening, what is going on. But there is intense pressure to also run the story of, you know, uh, you know this removes cat urine from your rugs. Does it really do that? Turn in at six. Those kind of, because believe it or not, there's a whole lot of people who want to know if this works. <laughs> and but it's a but you know, see, the problem is that people don't know what to trust anymore. So you've got a bunch of people trusting Fox News that's giving them facts, and they're, they're not. I do see, it's like one thing, you should be really careful when you try to open up that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> open it a little. Let some pressure out. Yeah, it's, uh, and if it squirts on you, just sorry about that. Just I'll put on. Shake it up. Yeah, shake it up. Have it this way. Yeah, all you have to do is tweet that John Delano ruined your bottle. Of, uh, <laughs> um, right, one of, one of the things that I I tend to do on my blog, I can't really speak for anyone else, but um, uh, a friend of mine once described it as kind of fact checking with with uh, with attitude. Um, I will I will go up against uh, you know the Tribune Review editorial page and they they certainly entitled to their their political opinion but when the facts are thrown around as you know climate change is a hoax well that's not fact you know the the thing that that at least in general national terms I'm not going to talk about uh, local news the 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 thing that kind of raises the uh, uh, hackles on a lot of local bloggers or political bloggers is the tendency in national news to do a kind of a he said, he said thing. You see the, the biggest example was the Swift Boat uh, Veterans for Truth. I don't do this normally, but uh, you have to, in the extraordinary circumstances, where the, the Swift Boaters would say, Carrie didn't deserve the Silver Star, or the Silver, uh, yeah, the Silver Star. Uh, and then the news reporters, or ABC or whomever, would go to the Carrie campaign and the Kerry campaign would say, well, yes, he did. And then the national news would go, well, we've achieved our objectivity by having both sides and not taking a side. Well, but let me, let me take issue with this a little bit. You're absolutely right, and this is, and, and look, we're all guilty of this. We give equal time for, for 
perhaps relatively unequal points of view. This happens, and it does happen. But and I'll have people though send me stories saying, "It you know, why don't you say that so and so is a dirty scum?" And I'll say, "That's not my job. If you want to accuse someone of being a dirty scum, maybe I can put that on TV. But it's not my job to determine the factual accuracy. And this is in a political campaign, you know, in the yeah. political context." It's not up for, it's not up to me to pick and choose who's telling the truth and who isn't telling the truth. You're putting a reporter in a very difficult position if when you if you're asking the reporter to be your fact checker. The fact checkers, I think the blogosphere, I think the uh, new media does an excellent job of that. I'll do some fact checking on, <laughs> on television ads. I've done that before. But we have to be super careful. It's not up to us to really decide whether uh, you know, Mitt Romney has Romnesia or not. You know, we can report that this is what Obama says about him, but it's not up to me to fact, fact check it. Sue? Um, there's kind of a trend now in some of the major media sites to have the reporters lie. Yes. Time does it. Well, Newsweek, Sue, we'll be doing it all the time. Yeah. Um, CNN, and so forth, and so forth around the, the political spectrum. To me, that's like this false distinction because Journalist is never going to go out as a journalist. I mean, they're always going to maintain some level of um, credibility and also some restraint because they have the reputations to protect and, and hopefully ethics. And I kind of perceive that as a marketing game, you know, marketing tool that they're saying, oh, John Delton is going to share with you on his blog or Tony Norman's going to blog. They're, they're just basically columns. Yeah. So why do we have, I mean, is that just I don't of blog. The transition? <laughs> well, but, but if you did blog, but but, it, but I know that no, what you're saying is so true. I mean, and there is pressure. I can't do it because I have so much to do as it is. It's very tough for me to do everything that I want to do in a given day. Um, I think someday, I mean, Twitter allows me a little bit of chance to voice a little bit of opinion. Although I'm <laughs> I'm fairly careful about that, and a lot of times, uh, you know, we all we don't. When we retweet something, that doesn't mean we agree with it, but it certainly means that we want to generate discussion and talk, and I do that a lot. Uh, and sometimes I'll even say, any thoughts, any comments, and I'll re uh, retweet uh, you know, Ann Coulter's disgusting comment about Barack Obama the other day, and just to see whether I get the feedback one way or the other. And a lot of times that does, we do generate conversation. But I have to be super careful. And I think with blog, and, and I'm the same way because I write a monthly business column uh, for the Pittsburgh Business Times, and, which is mostly all political, my stuff. And again, I try to be, I'm careful of, of what it is I'm doing. Someday when I'm retired from TV, I'll join these guys. Well, maybe not. I don't know if I agree with all your views. But I might have my own blog. Yeah. But, it, but it join the blogosphere. But I think you're right that there is pressure from a, from a PR standpoint to push people out to do more of that. Um, I don't see it so much in KDKA. I think what we're trying to do is make sure that our stories that people are now accessing on their laptops are available via the internet. And that's kind of the role I see. Well, the people who do it well are the city paper, yes. in my opinion. But they don't pretend they're really personally belonging. They make the joke about blog where they need to sign on it. But they're writing stories that are breaking that they can't Hold until the next week. And to me, that works because they're waiting for paper. A daily media site, it just seems really rather Well, it, it strikes me that when, like, if, if Joe Klein of Time, if he's, you know, if he's going to be blogging, it's just kind of a for, for people when they get online, they have more instantaneous content from the writers that they like or the writers that they don't like rather than waiting <laughs> for the next issue of Time or the next. Uh, you know, if you if you like a political reporter, or following him on Twitter. Yeah, or following him on Twitter. It it it, it strikes me as kind of a. Uh, it's not exactly what they're doing in print, but it's a version of the print thing for really fast uh, consumption. Uh, I do get to say though, as a, as a blogger, I don't have to be careful with my uh, <laughs> with my opinion. Uh, I just have to be consistent, and I mean there are there are of course issues of. Uh, um, uh, libel issues that I that I have to pay very close attention to because I can't say that someone is acting illegally. Uh, I can't say that that um, uh, Senator J 
Jones. There's no actual Senator Jones, is there? I don't think so. No. U.S. Sorry. Senator Jones from the state of Franklin um, is 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 a scumbag because he's taken bribes from the X Y Z uh, industry. I can't say that because then I have actually defamed someone. I've actually uh, libeled someone. But as far as uh, having a, a, an opinion, I don't have to have your restrictions on being um, not taking sides. I can take sides. Right. Uh, well, I get I, accused. I mean, I, anybody who reports politics is going to get accused of taking sides all the time. Yeah. And hardly a week goes by that I don't get some email from somebody who thinks that I'm too nice to Mitt Romney or too nice to Barack Obama or why did I do that to Paul Ryan? And, you know, you just, and those are the partisans. Um, I remember one campaign where the campaign manager of a candidate for governor got all over my case because I ended up, because in his view, I was giving more sound time. That is, the other candidate was getting more time to say words. So what I did is I went back, and I, and I also, moving forward, I was very careful that if I get, gave 17 seconds to, let's say, Dan Honorado, it, it wasn't that campaign, by the way. But if I give 17 seconds to Dan Honorado, I gave 17 seconds to Tom Corbett. I mean, it was that precise. Because people, in their own minds, they, they, they think, no matter what you do, unless you are really on board with their candidate, they think you're with the other guy. And it's, it's a very tough and difficult position to be in and those, as a political reporter. And those are all, but I take it. Those are all relative terms. Uh, I, this is not necessarily a blogging story, but a long, long time ago, uh, I knew someone <coughs> who was making kind of the blanket statement of, the whole news media is liberal. So I decided to, you know, feed him some bait. And I said, well, even even Fox News is, you know, Fox News, if, even if you accept their premise of being fair and balanced, they don't present themselves as uh, uh, liberal. They certainly can't be, you know, so I said, they certainly can't be accused. I mean, Roger Ailes is the guy who ran the show. Roger Ailes was the guy who put Ronald Reagan into the White House with the Morning in America commercials. And he said, this guy said to me, in all sincerity, Roger Ailes, at best, he's a centrist. That the, this guy was so far to the right that Roger Ailes was at best a centrist. <coughs> so by saying, you know, by 17 seconds here, whoever is on the far left is going to see you on the right. Who is ever on the far right is right. going to see you right. on the left. You, you just can't win those arguments. So. Yes, sir. Uh, I agree with you that Fox News has a lot of opinion programming, but they also have a news hour that's hosted by Brett Baer. And there's some really serious, I tend to follow national security type stories. Right. And there's a really big one that's developing right now that Brett Baer has done extensive, exclusive reporting on. And if you watch ABC News, it hasn't been reported yet. And I'm talking about Benghazi. Right. So I think it's a little off to say that all of the Fox News channel is opinion. I would never say that, by the way. There are some outstanding reporters at Fox Brent News. is one of the best in the business. He is a good one. And just as there are some very good reporters at MSNBC and CNN. For so Matthews, right? here's one of the problems I have with the way these state, but, the, but there's no doubt that Fox is playing to a certain audience. During and, certain programming And they, they discovered that that's where their revenue base is. And hey, you know, same with, with MSNBC. What bothers me most as a democracy as we move forward is that I think all of us are guilty of watching the news that reinforces our prejudices. We're watching the news, we're reading the news, we're logging on to the stories, the, the, the web-based newspapers, but we're only looking for things that tend to agree with our preconceptions of stuff. And that's very unlike what happened with our grandparents, where, where of course you have the three stations that felt somewhat of an obligation to, be, to cover everything or to cover a lot. But also you didn't have, it wasn't quite the, the choice. And so because we have so much choice out there, it has allowed us, but, I mean, that's, that's good, but it also puts more of a burden on us as citizens, it seems to me, to not tune off Fox because we happen to be liberal, for precisely the point you're making, sir. Or to tune off MSNBC because we love Bill O'Reilly and we love that conservative stuff. Uh, and I'm worried that as we go forward in, uh, in the years ahead, that we're only going to watch the stuff that uh, that we like. So I, your just, point the, is, just well the, character, the characterization was the thing. Yeah. I mean, the last 15 minutes of the program has Warren Williams on it, more Elias. Oh, yeah. There's liberal 
Sure. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. Actually, to that point, I heard a great quote by a guy who said it recently uh, that you watch news to be affirmed as opposed to being informed. I yeah. think that's a really you know, I nice think that's, way that's to say that. That's a nice way to say that. And it's, it's troublesome. It's troublesome. Yeah. Question now for you guys. Um, I have a friend, he works uh, in the political business and they manage campaigns. And he works on both sides. And so, when you have people like that who are managing campaigns, how does that influence what you guys do, both the new media and old media? Well, it, the the uh, lots of campaigns shoot me lots of emails every day. Certainly now, past you know month, two months, whatever, of take a look at this, take a look at that. And if there's something that I think is interesting for me to write on, um, since I am a blogger, I get maybe one or two shots a day of writing a story. I don't have to be uh, a news source that covers a broad uh, range of things. So if there's nothing that interests me, I just take a pass on it. Uh, but also you have to have to keep an eye on why is, the, why is this campaign sending me this story at this time for this reason? There's always a danger of, am I getting played? And even if the story is right, even if it's something that's, that's uh, good to look at, if I get the impression that I'm getting played for some reason, then there's more than enough toys to play with out there. I don't have to, just because someone sends in the story, I don't have to write on it. There's a fair, in this region, yeah. source always counts. Uh, you always have to take into consideration the source of who is sending you the story. In this region, there's a fairly uh, small group of people who have been campaign managers. And they do float from one campaign to the other. And, and I, as a reporter, have developed good relationships with a number of these campaign managers who work for only Republicans or who work for only Democrats. And you learn pretty quickly which ones you can trust, which ones are spinning you, which ones lie, which ones are, uh, you know, are, are just not the ones you want to deal with. Um, for the most part, I have found the people who are in this business, and it is a business, they're getting paid to be, I mean, I don't know if your buddy is or not, but they're getting paid to, to do this. Um, they understand that they have a job to do. And to the extent that it interacts with media, and I can't speak to the, to the, to the, uh, you know, the social media side or the blog side, but as they relate to professional on the television side, um, I have found almost every one of the managers that I've dealt with in this campaign and in other campaigns to be highly professional and to be really good people. To me, the most important thing, when I call your, first of all, I want your cell number and I want to be able to call it and have you call me back within five minutes because I'm always on deadline. And so the good people, the good managers know that I'm on a tight deadline, that I'm probably, if I'm calling them at 12 o'clock noon, I may want to put their candidate on TV at four. We run news from four to seven. I may want to put them on at four, four hours from now. So I need a quick turn back, turn around. And those <coughs> relationships that we develop from a, an old media standpoint, are really, really important to us. It may be a little different from the blog side because you have a particular point of view. Yeah. And the, and the Luke Rabesols, their, their campaign managers may not want to talk to you. Yeah, know. and, and you know, I, I, don't, I don't think uh, myself is, is important at all that if I'm going to call the, uh, you know, if there's a, if I'm going to call the Peduto folks, uh, they might not call me back. Well, that's not necessarily a, a, a disrespect on their part. It's because, you know, my audience your audience is like this. My audience might be like this, of people who want to read what I write because, say, it reaffirms rather than, I'm trying to inform, but it might just reaffirm and the, the campaign would just go, eh, why, why bother with D'Angelo because he's just talking to this very small choir. Right. So I, I, I don't necessarily right. go down that route. If it happens, that's great and certainly take advantage of whatever contact I have. Uh, but it's not necessary for me to do my job. Right. And that is another huge difference between old media and new media. I mean, I have an audience, and I know that the reason I get interviews with Barack Obama and Romney is because they know I have this audience in a must-win political state. And so my counterparts at WCBS New York City never interview Barack Obama because we know New York is always going to vote for Barack Obama or for the Democrat. And it's the fact that Pennsylvania's voters have been a very... Uh, um, hard to pin down, although in recent years more inclined to vote Democratic presidentially, 
But still, right now, I mean, the polls suggest the state could go either way. Um, it's because of that that I get these interviews. So I, I, I also admit I'm aggressive. I mean, I, I go after it. I find out who the right people are to talk to. I send them multiple emails and, and phone calls. And I, you know, so I do the stuff. But I know in the end, when Paul Ryan agreed to sit down with me and no other TV reporter in Pittsburgh, it was because I had pushed at it and because he knew winning Western Pennsylvania was, is, it's very important, frankly, to the Romney campaign. They can't win the state of Pennsylvania unless they do very well out here. So I know how that works. And that is very different. Than <laughs> yeah, they send the email. Right. Yeah. On the other <laughs> hand, on the other hand, if you worked for, um, you know, for realclearpolitics.com, which has now become a a news generator. Huffington Post clearly is, but Huffington Post has a political view. But real clear politics pretends at least to be, and I think they are for the most part, neutral. I suspect their reporters are getting access probably to top Romney and top Obama officials that uh, you would not be able to. And again, it's because that's an audience. The realclearpolitics.com has a huge audience among the political I'm thinking one last question. It's 11.47. Yes. Uh, so how do you feel about The Daily Show, like programs like The Daily Show, and, and like Colbert Report, how they skew their, well, they skewer reporting in the news? Yeah. Um, well, they're not the only ones who are skewing reporting in the news. I, let me just first say that my 17-year-old son gets all his news from from those two shows, from John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. <laughs> Because you know, he can believe them. <laughs> I don't know whether he believes them or not. He finds them entertaining. And that goes back to this point we are making earlier, that, that local news is not particularly entertaining. National news isn't entertaining. But he likes the way those two guys present the news. Now, John Stewart, who is generally liberal, goes after Obama. And so it's not always as, as one-sided as it might be. And my son doesn't vote yet, so it doesn't matter, I guess, in this game. But I, he'll never watch me on TV. He never watches me. <laughs> so, so um, what do I, I mean, the, the question is, what do I think of those? I mean, that's entertainment. That's what it is. It's not really a source of news. They're just, to me, I don't see them as a source of news anymore than I would tune in to Rachel Maddow or, or uh, Bill O'Reilly as a news source. I just think it's different. Uh, I, I think they have a right to play out there. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I have seen some uh, surveys that were done uh, that people who do watch, and, and I do think it's, it's kind of a, you go, to getting all of your news from The Daily Show, all of the news from The Colbert Report. Um, but the folks who do get their news from there are generally well informed about the world. It's just that it's packaged uh, in a way that there's a gag next to it. There's a, there's a gag that's a joke. But in order to get the gag, you have to understand the fact that it's based on it. Um, the same, the same surveys, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, although those folks who get their entirety of their news by watching um, uh, Bill O'Reilly or uh, listening to Rush Limbaugh tend to be incredibly uninformed about uh, reality. Uh, although they think they they are incredibly informed about reality, which is a very odd uh, discrepancy to that. But I guess the the answer is. Read from as many uh, right. news sources. Right. Read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Yeah. Although I think some of them are behind subscriptions. Again, I get, I get a subscription thing every now and then from uh, uh, the You know, we, we should say, you know, David, that one example of how new media has taken over is the news this past week or so that Newsweek is going out of business as a print magazine. I remember when this magazine was like that thick back when I was growing up, and it was a wonderful weekly news magazine. I mean, now it's down to hardly anything. They're going strictly online. Online. So they have decided old media doesn't work, new media is where it's at. And I think if, if I were to conclude on this, I would say that there is so much that old media has to offer that what they ought to do, and what I think is happening, what the trend line is, is this, let's get joined at the hip guys, and we'll make it work together. And I think that's what we're Should we start singing? That's <laughs> probably dance. Yeah. Dance. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. No, I'll see this on TV. Yeah. I'll dance. I'll dance. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you very much. much.